Welcome to Radio Signals. My name is Mark. My call sign is November 9 Whiskey India Bravo. And this is the Technician License Series for Amateur Radio. This is the first step in getting your Technician License. And our first lecture is going to be Introduction to Amateur Radio. So what is Amateur Radio? So Amateur Radio differs from other communication methods in that it is a direct wireless radio communication between licensed amateurs locally or across the world. It's more than just a radio service or a method of communication. It's actually a community of, of people involved in a very interesting hobby. The unique things about amateur radio is that there's really nothing else that is required. It doesn't require the internet. It does not require a phone line. There's no monthly or uh, there's no monthly subscriptions or monthly fees. And the only investment is really a radio and an antenna to start off with. And sometimes you can even pick up a radio for under $30 and get started in the hobby with your technician license. So who's involved in amateur radio? The answer is that Anybody can be involved in amateur radio. Everyday people, uh, classically, it's probably thought of as a bunch of people like scientists, engineers, astronauts, doctors, all of which are commonly involved in amateur radio, but it's filled with everyday people. It could be kids, adults, men, women, in the United States and across the world. And there have been some radio amateurs uh, that have been heads of state, musicians, broadcasters, and even athletes. Uh, actors are also commonly involved in amateur radio, such as Tim Allen. Tim Allen plays a ham radio operator on his television show, but he's actually a licensed ham radio uh, operator in real life as well. As of this recording in 2020, there are probably a little more than 750,000 licensed ham radio operators in the United States. And it just doesn't involve the United States. This is a, a worldwide uh, passion or hobby with over 3 million amateur radio operators in various countries, such as Europe uh, and probably any other country in the world. There's really no uh, age limit. As long as you can pass the first uh, license, you can get your ham radio license. Kids as young as six years of age to uh, people as old as uh, centenarians or people over 100 years of age are currently ham radio operators. So there's no real age limit. So ham radio is a method of communication. So how does that method differ than other methods of communication? So why bother spending the time and energy studying and paying some fees to get your license when there are other methods of communication available, such as citizen span radio or CB radio, for example. Um, for CB radio, the frequencies are channelized. So it's not just a range of frequencies you can operate on. There are 40 specific channels ranging from around uh, 26.96 megahertz to 26.4 megahertz. And the power output for your radio is limited to 4 watts. This provides local communication, maybe up to 20 miles under good conditions, and no uh, license is required. It's a, a good method of communication. It's, in fact, how I started off, probably in radio when I was in high school. I did uh, have a CB along with my friends and did communicate with them in uh in the cars and on weekends, and we found it a nice, fun thing to do as a hobby. There are other methods of communication available, too. There's the Family Radio Service, or FRS. These are the typical kind of walkie-talkie uh, devices you can pick up at any hardware store or Walmart or whatever uh, big box store you want. Um, these small radios are comprised of 22 different channels. Again, this is channelized and not open to a wide range of frequencies. The frequency range is anywhere between 462 megahertz to 467 megahertz. And again, this is a method of communication where an individual license is not required. So you don't have to apply to the FCC to get a license for this. You can use this for personal or business. And it's effective up to maybe one to two miles, depending on conditions and line of sight communications. But there's very limited power output. You're limited to around two watts of power. There are slightly more powerful uh, ways to communicate, such as 
General Mobile Radio Service, or GMRS. This has 30 channels and ranges from uh, approximately the same frequency, 462 megahertz to 467 megahertz in the FM range. However, an FCC license is required, uh, but you can communicate by voice and also data methods. You can have uh, little portable walkie-talkie devices, or you can have mobile radios, and you can also connect through something called a repeater, where you transmit your voice or a signal to another antenna and a radio that repeats your signal and uh, increases the range that you can actually get, uh, that you can communicate on. It's for personal use, and you can communicate up to 25 miles and the power output's a little bit more than CB radio and other methods of up to 50 watts. In amateur radio, you can have local, regional, worldwide, and space communication. So you can see how this difference differs in the other uh, methods of communication that are open to the general public. Um, with the other methods of communication, you typically cannot communicate worldwide. You cannot engage in space communication. And as you can see, the maximum power output is significantly more than uh, FRS or other methods. And amateur radio can transmit up to 1,500 watts, depending on the mode of operation and the frequency that you choose, and also your license class. And again, for amateur radio, an FCC license is required. You need to study, and you need to take an exam, and you need to receive a call sign before you can operate. With amateur radio, you can use uh, handheld devices similar to those little walkie-talkies that you can pick up at Walmart or other stores, but they're much, much more powerful and uh, versatile for communication. You can use, you can pick up a mobile device, so you can pick up a mobile radio and either install it in your home or you can install it in your car uh, to talk to uh, friends and acquaintances back and forth um, from work. Or you can use it kind of on an outdoor adventure. If you're into off-roading, you can communicate between vehicles while doing that. Um, you can also communicate through repeaters to extend the range of communication for those small handheld devices or your mobile devices also. For amateur radio, you can communicate through voice. You can communicate through data, and you can also do something called amateur television or slow scan television where you can actually transmit and receive uh, some t uh, slow speed television signals. The only difference with amateur radio is that it cannot be used to conduct business. So that's against the rules. You cannot use this to operate your business or conduct business over the radio. That's uh, kind of a no-no and against licenses. History of amateur radio dates back to Marconi. Marconi sent the first wireless Morse code signal across the Atlantic Ocean uh, in 1901. So this was a, obviously a wireless signal through something called CW or Morse code. And the first amateur license was granted in 1912. So this is not a new hobby. It goes back, obviously, over 100 years. And the it seems to actually predate the FCC. So the FCC was established in 1934, and the Amateur Service, uh, which is the formal name for ham radio or amateur radio, was formally communicated, uh, created by the FCC in 1934. Many hams have prior military service and were involved in critical communication during World War uh, II and other wars. And it's also viewed as a stepping stone to careers in science and engineering. So a lot of people who get involved in amateur radio at a young age uh, generate a lot of interest in science and technology and radio communication and go on to become electrical engineers or other radio operators or broadcasters or just a general stepping stone for other careers in science. And a lot of ham radio operators have contributed to scientific advancement of wireless communication. So that's another benefit of amateur radio to the general population. So how do hams communicate? Uh, you can see these young hams or youth on the air communicating by voice. So you can pick up a microphone and actually communicate with people directly through voice communication locally regionally and through throughout the world.
with the appropriate equipment. In the old days, this used to be a, a main method of communication, Morse code. It used to be required as part of the ham radio uh, license, even at the technician uh, level. There were, there were various, there were more levels of ham radio licenses in the past, but this was required for um, more advanced licensure. However, this is no longer a requirement for uh, ham radio or amateur radio uh to obtain your license, but it is an interesting method of communication and the signals can um, probably get out a little further than voice communication can. And you can kind of share this with your, your children. It's almost kind of a secret code type of communication. And nowadays there are more various forms of communication that have become available. A lot of hams are communicating through digital format, through uh, their computer. You can just exchange call signs and see how far your signal propagates throughout the world by various uh, different methods. But you can also carry on keyboard to keyboard communication with other hams, either locally um, or in different countries or across the United States. And as I mentioned before, hams can also send uh, slow scan television pictures. So you can communicate and send uh, photographs or small uh, slow scan television signals across the airwaves with ham radio. So for ham radio, you can, you can communicate locally. So this is typically done on uh, bands that are, are referred to as VHF and UHF. So the very high frequency range and ultra high frequency range um, allows people to talk uh, to either them uh, between two people or in a group. Uh, you can take your radio on a hike. You can talk with other friends or hams on your way to work, either by directly communicating with them on a certain frequency or by, by using a repeater to uh, communicate a little bit further. The VHF and UHF local communication is available to the technician class, general class, and extra class. For local communications, it's generally line of sight. So meaning as far as you can see over the horizon, your radio signal should propagate or should get to another person or location as long as you can see that over the horizon. And this can vary depending on the terrain. If there's a lot of buildings or structures in the way, then obviously your signal is not going to get that far. Uh, this can allow you to transmit by a lower power simplex handheld radios within a few miles. So you can communicate with one of those small little walkie-talkie devices within a few miles uh, using the local communications that a uh, technician class license holds. But if you go on to a repeater, uh, repeaters are typically uh, larger antennas, either freestanding or placed on tall buildings that will allow you to communicate much farther in the range of 25 to 50 miles. So this is an example of direct communication. You can either uh, have a QSO or conversation between two handheld radios with two licensed operators, or you can communicate with a handheld device to a mobile device. Say you're on a hike and your friend's uh, going home from, from work in his or her car. So you can actually communicate directly uh, with that person by the mobile radio and also the handheld radio. As I mentioned before, you can also communicate through a repeater. The signal goes from your handheld device or mobile device to a freestanding tall antenna or an antenna on a tall building that uh, repeater or antenna receives that signal and retransmits and repeats it and thereby giving it much broader range up to the range of 25 to 50 miles. So ham radio operators can also communicate regionally. You can use something called near vertical incident skyway propagation. This is on the, uh, the medium to HF bands. Uh, this can provide communication statewide, so anywhere from zero to 400 miles. And the frequency range is usually this is on 1.8 through 7.3 megahertz. And you can also take part of this as a technician if you have, if you know CW or Morse code. So technicians also have privileges on the high frequency bands that are limited to the CW or Morse code range. 
So this figure is kind of a representation of how NVIS works. So near vertical incident skyway propagation. What essentially happens is that you have an antenna set up that will transmit. The antenna is directed pretty much straight up or on a small angle, and it hits the upper atmosphere, specifically the ionosphere, and the signals actually bounce back to Earth on more of a regional level. So instead of the uh, the signals being broadcast throughout the whole world, the angle uh, that you're transmitting actually hits the upper atmosphere or ionosphere, and the signals are returned more on a regional basis. So amateurs can communicate across the country or worldwide, and this is available to the general class population, uh, general class license or extra class license on the medium to high frequencies. You can also communicate by VHF and UHF communication, and these methods are available to all ham radio amateur classes with the help of internet gateways. So this is not direct radio communication. You can utilize a a uh, handheld transceiver or a mobile VHF UHF unit to transmit to a repeater, which has the ability to actually connect up to the internet. Your signal will go from that repeater into the internet and be transmitted to a note through a gateway and be transmitted to um, a, another repeater. Maybe let's say you're in California. It can be transmitted or travel to New York through the internet, be received by that repeater and be transmitted over the air to another person who has access to that repeater on a handheld or mobile device. So you're essentially transmitting from a handheld or mobile radio to a repeater through the internet gateway. The internet gateway transfers the information to another repeater. That repeater receives the information and then retransmits it through the airwaves to another portable or handheld. Ham radio operators can also uh, engage in satellite communication. So there have been many uh, different satellites that actually carry ham radio transceivers on board that are usually in the VHF to UHF range. So you can use a uh, mobile device or a handheld transmitter and transmit to a satellite, which will uh, receive your signal and retransmit that signal back down to Earth. So that's another way you can actually engage in uh, more worldwide or regional communication through the use of satellites. And HAMS have also talked to astronauts on the International Space Station. There have been many astronauts that have had their ham radio license and have operated in space and have communicated with hams back on the ground. Hams also engage in something called Earth-Moon-Earth -Earth communication. And this is kind of neat in that your signal is actually transmitted towards the moon. It bounces off the moon's surface back to Earth. So that's why it's called Earth-Moon-Earth. -Earth. Your radio signals are actually transmitted through space hit the moon, and are actually reflected back to Earth. Uh, and this is done with VHF and UHF and uh, digital signals. So amateur radio is not just an indoor hobby. There are other things such as summits on the air, parks on the air, hidden transmitter hunting called fox hunting, and field day where amateurs actually get outside and operate in uh, the fresh air with other amateurs. Summits on the Air, or SOTA, S-O-T-A, um, allows you to go to various summits that have been pre-published on their website, and either you can drive up to uh, the summits and just continue your hike up to the summit of a mountain or very uh, tall peak and communicate with other amateurs. So this is usually done with VHF or HF operations, and you can obtain points based on the elevation or difficulty of the summit and kind of keep track of your points that you accrue for summits on the air activity or soda activity. For those people who don't are afraid of heights or don't want to, or don't have a summit available in their state or local area, you can engage in something called parks on the air or POTA. Uh, you can operate from national or state parks by VHF for HF communications or UHF communications and do essentially the same thing. You can accrue points based on the number 
of context and the park location. So this is another way of getting out on the air and getting outside with ham radio. Hidden transmitter hunting is also something fun to do. Essentially, a low-powered transmitter is hidden either in a park or forest or another location, uh, maybe within a city, and various hams get together with a portable antenna that has the ability to have a lot more of a directional component to it. And it's kind of a, of a contest to see who can find the hidden transmitter first. And it can be kind of very similar to geocaching. So instead of uh, trying to find a location by latitude and longitude, you're actually hunting a uh, transmitter down and trying to find it with radio signals. And there's also the ARRL Field Day. That's the M uh, American Radio Relay League Field Day that occurs every summer on the fourth weekend of June. There are also winter fields, field days as well, and you can operate with other hams. It's an informal, not necessarily a contest, but it can be considered a contest. Uh, the purpose is to, to kind of get outside on emergency power and not utilize um, an indoor station and bring your rig outside and to practice emergency operation and response and just communicate with, with other hams on a summer or winter day. You can also take part in other events. So you can actually utilize ham radio as a service for the public. There's the Amateur Radio Emergency Services, or ARIES. Uh, this is offered to qualified ham operators. You do have to have, obviously, an amateur radio license and some degree of training in the emergency radio services. Some degree of uh, FEMA training is required or Federal Emergency Management Association. You do have to kind of take some introductory courses to the incident command system and then additional ARIES training. And you can get together with your local ARIES group and uh, be ready to respond in case of an emergency on a local or national level. If you're interested in weather, you can also contribute to uh, public service by being a storm spotter yeah, through Skywarn. This is through the National Weather Service. Uh, there are classes uh, for storm spotter training either online or through, through your local National Weather Service Center. Uh, the storm spotters provide what's called ground truths to the National Weather Service. So uh, as a storm spotter, you're going to collect and report data such as uh, presence of high winds, uh, tornadoes, or hail or other significant weather reported to uh, through a repeater and to other hams operating through Skywarn or WeatherNet will uh, provide this to the National Weather Service in near real time. You can also be a public service by supporting communications at regional or local events. So if there's a parade or a marathon or a race in your community, typically ham radio operators will volunteer to provide communications um, for that event. And the ARRL, or the American Radio Relay League, it exists to advance the art, science, and enjoyment of amateur radio. Uh, it provides educational resources. It provides advocacy. So the, as an example, the FCC proposed to charge amateur radio, uh, new licenses and upgrades a $50 fee. And the ARRL, uh, was instrumental in advocating that the fee be reduced to, uh, $35 from 50, from $50. They also provide other educational resources and materials such as on the air magazine for newer intermediate operators and also other magazines such as QST, which is geared towards more um, advanced operators as well as other magazines. Ham radio also provides other benefits. Uh, you can join a local club and meet new friends. You can, through that club, you can get to know other ham radio operators who are more experienced and may be able to help you through and you get your technician license or go on to uh, getting your general or extra class license or answering any questions you may have or even getting your station up and running. So these mentors are known as Elmers in the ham radio community. Other benefits of ham radio, you can learn about electronics and the science of radio. 
and through communication, either regionally throughout the country or throughout the world, you can actually learn about other cultures. So that's another benefit. There are three amateur radio license classes uh, as of 2020. There used to be five. Right now, it's the technician class, which is the entry-level license, the general class, and also the amateur extra class, which is the final stage of of being a ham radio operator as far as uh, licensing. So how do you get licensed? Well, the first thing you need to do is study. So you can study by accessing resources on the internet through YouTube. Uh, there are various websites with study material. And the ARRL also offers license manuals and other books that are specific to the license class. So they have a technician manual, they have a general class manual, and they also have an extra class manual that are available directly through purchase through the ARRL or through Amazon. Um, as I mentioned, there are other formal online courses. And another important resource is the question pool. So once you study, you are going to be asked to take a exam that's specific to your um, license class. So there's a large question pool for each class. The ARRL has the question pool online. Um, I believe you can find the question pool on other websites as well, but you can actually take practice exams and go through the entire question pool on the ARRL website. And that's going to be extremely useful for you to do to actually practice for taking the exam before you sign up for a, uh, before you sign up for the exam and take it in person. So to take the exam, you should find a local club that offers exams. And you can also consider taking the exam online. Um, there are more and more different opportunities to take the exam online or in person. The license is good. Once you pass the exam, it's good for 10 years. And you can only operate only after you pass the exam and your call sign is issued. And you can look at the call sign when it's available on the FCC database. So the ability to actually take the exam and become a amateur radio operator in the United States is available to all except as a representative of a foreign government. So there are obviously foreign uh, amateur radio operators, but they have individual licensing within their own countries. So you need to be uh, United States and operate in the U.S. and not be a representative of a foreign government to get your license here within the United States. The technician exam has 35 questions. The question pool is much, much larger than uh, 35 questions. And as a technician, if you pass, you'll have access to all amateur radio frequencies above 30 megahertz. Um, and you'll have access to, to very limited HF uh, high frequency privileges on 10 meters and CW on some of the other HF bands as well. The next step is to uh, go on to general, a general class. The exam has the same number of questions, 35 questions from a different question pool, and you need to pass the technician exam first. So these are, these are tiered licenses. You need to pass tech first, then go on to general, then go on to amateur extra. So the uh, technician privileges you have access to all the technician privileges as a general class operator, plus much, much more on the HF band, which will get you into regional communications and worldwide communications. Now, the final class is the amateur extra exam, the amateur extra class. The question pool is a little bit more. Instead of 35 questions, it has 50 questions from a large question pool. And again, you need to pass the technician and general class license exams first. And the uh, amateur extra class will essentially give you all privileges available to amateur radio operators. So this is your final class to be obtained. So we hope this uh, has a good introduction to amateur radio, and hopefully you'll go out and start studying for your amateur radio license as a technician or, or beyond, and then take the exam and, and become a ham. So have fun in 73.